very different topic today than our usual topics. <clears throat> today is all about video, so quite looking forward to that. Maybe I'm going to play you guys that video while we wait for the others to join. One, 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 or one shot, now the future for sure. Let's go. Yeah, I was building on the lecture. Versus coming daily under pressure. Working on the plot and the scheme. The true star trademark is at the edge of your dreams. I'm talking one. One shot for the kill, the breeze cut, freeze up, straight drop in the chills, I'm talking. Taking over pieces and shares, a ball big sky high, check the movement is here, yeah. Yeah, it's one heart, one shot, now the future is yours, go. I'm turning dreams into reality, in the lab with the formula and chemistry. The memories spark and motivate and make the industry shake. We put the balls in the place. I'm talking one, one chance at best. Yes, painting princes for the culture, keep the brushes fresh. Took the cover, work the drum, a passion never rests. Freedom is our teacher under pressure. Now we bless. See, I was so good for the go. It's one heart, one shot. Now the future is yours. Go. Yeah, it's one heart, one shot. Now the future is yours. Go. I'm just going to start and I would like to welcome everybody uh, to this talk today. So the webinar uh, by uh, Nico Deutsch, um, who is going to talk about underwater video with us today. Um, just before we start, I know there's lots of uh, people that have been here before, so it's, apologies if I repeat myself. My, uh, my company is Insider Divers. We organize land-based and riverboard scuba diving trips. We also have specific tips for wreck or tech uh, or tech and wreck, whatever. Um, we also do free diving or snorkeling trips with whales and dolphins and those kind of things. Um, and we also do photography workshops. Um, all of our trips are group trips. There's always an, at least one expert, if not more, traveling with you, making sure the itineraries are, are perfect. Um, and we focus a lot on education and coaching. Co coaching. So on all of our um, trips, we always have uh, some talks, uh, meeting a scientist, doing something uh, to improve our knowledge of the ocean, uh, because we believe in never stop learning. So that's why uh, in March, uh, I decided to set up this webinar series um, in order to make it possible for all of us to keep learning, even though we are uh, confined and not allowed to go in the ocean. So this is how this came about. We've now done almost 20 already, um, and so today uh, we've got Nico here. Just before we start, um, I just wanted to point out that we've got a lot of these uh, webinars already uh, recorded, so from different uh, either visitors or myself. We've got specific things on underwater photography or Lightroom editing. Uh, we've got specific talks on different animals. Just check out uh, our YouTube channel uh, under Insider Divers. There you can find a, a whole segment, Insider Academy, and there you'll find uh, uh, older content if you've missed it. Um, known him now for five years, uh, over five years actually. He's well known in Germany, uh, in the German dive industry, for being uh, uh, one of the um, head coaches from Canon for Underwater. He actually does a lot of coaching also for above water. So he's a professional videographer by trade. He's actually learned it in university. He's been diving for a long time. And uh, yeah, he's a really uh, a good guy to, uh, to watch him work, but also a really great guy to hang out with. So some people here, I can see Anna anyway, and I don't know who else have met him on uh, some of the trips he's joined us already. Um, so yeah, you guys all know he's a great guy. And everybody else, welcome Nico. Hi. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, everybody's ready. We've got 50 people here. Uh, looking forward to your talk. So um, I'm just going to stop my share so everybody can see you completely. And then you can take over the screen anytime you want. All right, then I would start. Perfect. Oh, then I would uh, start. Thank you for the introduction, Simon, first of all. And I would like to start to um, yeah, talk a bit about, about my background, where I come from, and what I do. And what uh, best way to start than where I really got into diving was uh, at a young age. Um, I've been always uh, fascinated by the water. And um, in German, we say uh, I was a Wasserratte, a water rat, at a young age, and then with uh, 10 years, uh, I did my open water, and soon after that, pretty much I went diving every year with my parents, and with, I think, 12, 13 years, I had my first proper compact camera underwater, 
and that was in 2008, I think. Um, this was also the first proper camera I had uh, where I started to do videos. And funny enough, uh, doing I, I was doing basically all these diving videos for fun, for memories. And this is really how I got also into video. So I started to study film and animation after school. And now I'm a, yeah, a full-time filmmaker. I do all sorts of commercial work, uh, documentary work uh, all around the world for TV, for uh, yeah, corporate uh, videos and uh, also underwater. Festivals is also one of my biggest, uh, this was me. I think at seven years old, and then yeah, at at ten I started at uh, my open water, uh, yeah, and then there was, I think I was uh, uh, thirteen or fourteen on that picture. Funny enough, not much has changed. <laughs> I still wear the same wetsuit, <laughs> and yeah, these are some uh, screenshots or stills from uh, some of my projects um, that I've been working in the last year. Um, and one of uh, the coolest projects uh, last year was definitely uh, Lake Baikal in Russia, where we filmed under the ice, and uh, that was really cool. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so where did I start before uh, you? Where, where, where did I stop? Uh, almost at this part, and I was wondering, hey. Almost at this part, okay. Um, yeah, so basically that's where I am right now. Um, full-time filmmaker and underwater videographer and today I yeah would like to talk about why you can get into video underwater video and um, yeah first of all one reason is it's so easy and affordable affordable now more than ever before um, I mean the, the ca there's such a big variety of cameras on the market and uh, there's also a good chance you already own a camera that is capable for video and there's pretty much uh, housing for almost any decent uh, camera right now. Um, so yeah, there, there's nothing to, to, to have an excuse for gear at the moment. Of course, it can be really expensive and we'll get, get to that. But um, to have a small memory, it's, it's uh, yeah, you can, you can do it. And um, so what I want to show you in, in a second is a video, one of my first videos I did underwater and going back to them and looking at them, it is really nice to see, like, uh, to, to have back these memories and now it's not much work to do and I think if you go back another 10 years or 20 years and you look back and you have this video you did, um, it's, it's really cool, not just for you, but also for your families and friends to share it with. So, yeah, and also if you want to learn new skills, I mean, if you do underwater video, you don't just learn to film underwater, but you can take all of these skills and apply them for many other things. If you um, do online video or wherever, you, you learn so much to it. Um, yeah, and may maybe you need it for your job, like uh, Simon does his trips, and so maybe he wants to sh share some of... Uh, his uh, yeah experiences um, on on social media whatsoever. If you do research uh, stuff, um, I mean a lot of I, you had LK I think yesterday, and I mean she does a lot of uh, photography as well for her research. So so it's, it's always good to 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 have a decent knowledge uh, on how to capture the the animals right and all of that. So yeah. And my last opinion, I think uh, videos are cooler than stills. I much more enjoy uh, vi <laughs> videos uh, than still photos. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I think, every... I mean, it's also not that hard to go from stills to video, I think. A lot of people always say, well, video is so much more uh, work afterwards. Yes, that's right. But if you know the basics, like... For you, Simon, you know all the basic rules and everything. So I, I think the transition to also the videos is, is not that big, in my opinion. But yeah. Um, so now I would like to... The difficult part is the, the editing, right? So it's, it's, you know, as a photographer, you can decide today I'll edit one photo or two photos. But with a video, it's only done when it's done. So that's what I always find the biggest difference. 
um, in terms of the amount of sort of after work, you have to do it all at once with video. But then I'm not so good with video editing as you are, so it takes much longer for me. Yeah, that's also something I want to show now is um, I have a, an, an old video here. It's from 2011. Um, it's, I think, the second or video underwater video we did. Um, and I'll ch I think I'll just scrub through it and play a few sections just to show you where, where we started off or where I started off. So, um, yeah, if, if you just have a... Whoop. If you have a quick look, like this is not the... Oh, let me just turn down the volume. Yeah, so this is not the greatest footage. You can see clearly the colors and um, it's a bit shaky. It's not too bad, I think, for back then. And remember, this is a, a camera from 2008. This is the TZ5 back then. But uh, looking back, I noticed so many things. And um, then I also, um, oops, not yet. We're not there yet. And then I also have this other clip here. This was just one year later. This was in 2012. And, and funny enough that you said it, you have to edit your videos. Well, I, can, uh, I can put my screen on screen so you should see me. Yeah, so this was, uh, this was one year later. And when you said you have to edit your videos, this is an issue. This video is not finished. I started editing, but I never finished it. And this is something where you need the dedication to say, okay, I'll sit down and I'll finish my video now. And looking at it now, I'm really, yeah, disappointed in myself that I did not finish it because it's, I think it, it was great to start it off. And uh, I, I checked the footage and I still have it. So maybe, maybe I'll finish it. Uh, someday soon but already here um when i look at the footage now there's a lot of improvement i started to build a story i had an introduction and so i, I really learned from from the years before and also if you go to the underwater footage you can also see directly in the colors there's a lot has changed i used a red filter and and all of that is a lot more stable um, I introduced, uh, I built a story, I introduced people, then I shot the um, wildlife, and this is all stuff that I want to talk about uh, today. And um, yeah, maybe Simon, if you could uh, quickly ask if, if the videos could, were, were yeah. playing all right or not, because, or if you could answer Simon, because then I have another video, this is a very recent one, uh, which I would like to Go show. Ahead. Um, it's all shot. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll just show it, and uh, it's uh, one minute. So I'll also turn on the audio for that, and I'll talk about the video after. Got so much weight on my shoulders. Enough to knock me out, but I'm still holding the throne. You never know till it's over. So pretty it hurts. Just beware of the thorns. You got a glimpse, and you can't resist. Luring you in closer. So I hope everyone could uh, see the video and it was not too laggy. Um, so why I wanted to show this is um, usually I have my big camera, which is sitting back here. It's quite heavy and junky, but I had a fun dive uh, with Sarah and um, uh, I wanted just to have a quick short dive and we took um, 
Yep, sorry. And we took uh, just a normal GoPro. Uh, Hero 7, I think. And I didn't take any lights with me. Um, nothing special. I, I just thought, okay, I'll do a quick video. Um, and I did edit it in maybe half an hour or maximum an hour. And I think for a quick fun dive without lights, without any big equipment, it is, it's quite something you can show or share with friends uh, to, to show the experience you, uh, you had on the dive. And this is something with the, a few rules and um, yeah, experience, then it's not that hard to do a video like that. And it doesn't take that much time. And um, also something I want to talk about um, later is that you don't need now a really strong computer anymore. I just recently picked up an iPad and it's crazy. You can edit 4K super th smoothly on an iPad. Um, so that's what I mean with all the accessibility right now, how easy it is and also how cheap and affordable it is. Nico? Yeah. We're currently seeing presenter view. So we can see the- You see button. presenter view. Okay. Uh, let me change that. Okay, we want the second screen. This one. Now it should be better. Am I back in the normal? Now we can see, yeah, perfect. Okay, right. So one of the first things that I see is, um, is very shaky footage. Uh, and this is something that I think is quite normal if you have a small camera or GoPro. Um, that the footage is quite shaky. And one of the things um, I can say is that I don't think a selfie state makes footage more um, less or less shaky uh, because you have a extension and therefore it can be even more shaky. Of course, if you film some sharks uh, in the Bahamas and uh, the tigers come really close, you might want that distance if you have a small camera, but really for um, steady shots, I would not recommend it. Um, I'd rather have it close to your body um, where you have a solid grip. Another thing is to help improve your um, footage to make it more stable is if you have a good buoyancy. So if you just started out diving and you have uh, five dives, dives only, it might help to really first practice on your buoyancy. Um, before you start um, on, on taking uh, videos. And then the next thing is when you film to focus. Of course, this is something that some instructors or others uh, don't, don't like when you're super, or, or other divers even, if uh, all the photographers or videographers are focused on their shot. But um, if, you, if you know what you wanna film and you really focus on that, um, then check really that you're like, yeah, just focus on it um, to, to do it and don't look around, check for other stuff and film, which I also see sometimes underwater that people just wander around and point the camera at stuff. So really focus on, on the shot you want to do. And um, some people, unfortunately... Uh, some, people might, uh, some people might say that's more realistic, you know, if it's, you know, following and it's a bit shaky like the bubbles. You don't agree with that? Well, maybe in some way, I mean, everything I say is uh, out of my perspective. I mean, there's no perfect rule for it. The same in photography, there are rules and then there are rules to be broken, basically, um, which you will see in some later pictures that I will show. But um, I think it is more pleasing for a viewer to have a more stable and, and focused shot, like, in the, it's same with virtual reality. You don't want to look around and, and put your own focus on that. The videographer should point where you want to look at and, and focus on that subject. And I think that's, uh, that's more enjoyable to watch, in my opinion. And um, do you sometimes, do you suggest using a tripod underwater? Um, yes. If you shoot macro, it is that probably only if you go, get really into macro it's i think the only way to have stable shots um especially if there's a tiny bit of current 
and you have super small objects, um, some snails or yeah. Um, for wide angle or wider stuff, uh, you don't really need it unless you want to do a time lapse or stuff like that, I think. Yeah. But for macro, I, I recommend it. And you don't necessarily need a tripod. For example, what you can also use uh, use if, uh, is a pointer, reef pointer, for example. And this one in particular has a, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it has a, a tripod thread. So what I do is I, I just put it on, on the camera. And if I do mud dives, for example, I can put it in the sand and get quite stable shots with it. So, yeah, and also I use it quite, huh? That's a very cheap solution. Cheap it's a cheap solution, yeah, of course. But it's, it's, it's a lot more compact than a, um, a tripod and you, yeah, you can take it on any dive with you and it is a multifunction tool. And this one here, it also has, for example, uh, a scale on it so you, can check how big your uh, shooting objects are, for example. And I use it also not uh, as a tripod, but also if I'm at the reef and there's current, so I don't touch the reef or anything and I want to get close to, to get a um, good, um, good solid um, yeah, uh, point uh, where I can, can be more stable. Um, yeah, and of course, I, uh, a bigger camera helps. Oh, Jesus, these slides. Um, so the bigger your camera is, the more mass it has, the less uh, it will be shaky. So with the smaller GoPro, it will be more easy to, to shake it around than with uh, a big camera. But there are some ways to get more stable footage. For example, as you see here in the picture, also Sarah has a, has a tray like this where you can mount all sorts of cameras. And this is actually my first try, uh, try I've ever had. And this gives you a lot more uh, stability. And, um, and yeah, for example, here, this is... Uh, this, is the, woo, this is the rig solution um, from Sarah. And yeah, it's, it's quite... It's, it's still, when she travels, it's quite compact compared to my gear. So, yeah. Are you going to show us your kit as well? Uh, well, my kit is, <laughs> unfortunately, it takes so long to set it up that I decided to leave it in the boxes. But as you can see, this is the naked camera. And you will see in a few photos um, how big it is. But this long weighs, I think, uh, maybe uh, here we are at over 10 kilos for sure. And um, and therefore, underwater, if there is current or something, it is, it is uh, harder to get shakes in. So that's also one reason why the footage with bigger cameras is a bit more smooth. Um, yeah. And also with the current, um, try not to go against, for example, currents and, and film while doing that. Like the more you paddle or shake, uh, the shakier your footage gets as well. And um, there are some shots where you want to do pants over the reefs where it's okay but try to go with the current or sideways but going against it where you you do exercise a lot or you need a lot of energy for it uh, is probably not the best way to keep uh, your footage uh, stable and um for all of these people that are afraid of all these manual settings um I would say don't be afraid you can start off in the automatic mode um because Basically, there are so many different settings you can set your camera to, but you don't have to always control everything. I think if you start off, you should focus on your stabilization and your framing and what you film. Like this is more important, I think, than the manual settings for, for that moment. And the first thing you should do if you want to get into manual settings is uh, check your white balance. Um, or go fix your white balance because underwater this is the one of the most crucial thing to to get the correct white balance because the cameras are not meant for underwater and of course we have more difficult um situations there um and yeah and that's the the thing focus on getting the colors right in camera in the first place this will help you a lot in the edit because if you you can edit colors also in video, but there are limitations, uh, especially if you have a GoPro or 
nothing that has super huge uh, files with a high color depth and um, yeah other, otherwise they the, the files will fall apart at some point and then the first addition to a camera so if you just have a camera and you want to improve your colors is to start off with uh, either a red or a mag magenta filter depending on if you uh, in which uh, type of waters you dive um, so a red filter basically I have one here uh, this is one to go into the camera. It's a bigger one, but these are also available for many, many housings uh, to screw on or to put on. And these will already help you a lot. I have an example of uh, some of my footage from back then. It was the TZ5, so a, a over 10 year old camera um, that I want to show you. Um, that's here. Uh, for example, this is a shot with the um, uh, without a red filter, and this is with red filter. Just a couple of seconds later, just to have a comparison. Uh, back then, I just did it for myself a test, and I thought it would be interesting to see um, uh, see one of these comparison shots. And really, this is the only one that I had. But there's already such an improvement in color. And to quickly explain what a red filter does is basically you lose a, re um, you lose a lot of red colors um, in the depth and your white balance is not capable of uh, balancing this out. And therefore the red filter gives you, um, gives you a strong shift uh, or more into these red tones. And uh, to, you can't bring all of them back, but um, it enhances it and it helps it a lot. Um, yeah, I had a talk with uh, Simon before. It's not easy to explain a red filter. Um, I wouldn't call it magic, but it kind of feels like magic underwater. You put it in front and it looks different. Um, One question. Yeah. I have Do you want to add any? Yeah. So, so uh, you, are, you were showing a, um, a, a, um, a 67 millimeter um, screw on red filter for inside the camera. Do you recommend that over an externally um, placed filter? No, uh, th this, this is one uh, from Keldan. Um, this is uh, one for, uh, I, I assume it's not for um, on camera, uh, on housing, um, because it's made for like DSLRs for wide angle and et cetera. Um, the reason you need to, or I need to screw it in is because I can't have it on the outside of my lens. So if you shoot with the uh, uh, dome ports, um, you can't really get a red filter on top of that. So therefore, I need to put the red filter in the camera. Um, I really haven't. I don't think there should be any difference if you have, like, if you have a small compact camera. There's not really a way to place it inside, and you're a lot more flexible when you have it on the outside. So for example, for uh, if you have uh, Sarah's camera, she has a M. M67 uh, thread. Right now there is a, also a wet lens on, which we'll talk about later. But basically here, she could throw on the red filter directly on, outside. And if she goes shallow, she could take it off. So I think you're more flexible with compact cameras than with the bigger ones. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question while we're on the red filter. See, I told you lots of people yeah. will ask about this. Um, uh, Faye is asking if, um, for different depths, you need different shades of red. Yes. So there are uh, different type of red filters for different depth rated. Personally, I, I, I try to find the middle path because uh, I have from Keldan one, it's M2. I hardly use it because I shoot with lights, which I will come to uh, now. Um, I, I tried the strongest one for the lowest depth, and you gotta um, remember the the deeper rated red filters. They also take out a lot more light, so your footage will get more noisier. Um, and I feel like I'd rather have one that is not so strong, and I will try to tweak more in uh, post production. Um, so. Yeah, I wouldn't go for the really deep and strong ones. I, I, I think this one is rated for 12 meters around that 12 to 15 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, 
you, you could do a lot of tests and see what, and again, everything is different with every camera. So what might work good with, for example, my camera will not work with the GoPro for, for example, because the, the sensors are completely different and, and this camera capture a lot more uh, colors. Oh. Um, right. And of course, if you have the option, then go for lights. Um, lights are, in my opinion, always the, the better solution if you can get close to your subject. Um, and we will talk at the end about all the gear, but either use a red filter, which are, is the cheaper option, but if you can and you want to get more into it, then definitely go for lights. All right, next up is uh, framing an angle. And you can already do a lot, like, as I said before, if you have your camera set on auto, just by framing everything right and looking uh, out for, for the same rules, basically, as in photography. Um, like, of course, all of these rules can be broken, um, but uh, like certain things like rule of thirds um, or don't shoot downwards in, um, uh, in underwater photography or videography. Um, it's a basic rule not to shoot downwards, but I have a video later in the editing part where I do shoot downwards. Um, so it always depends on if, if it fits or not. But in general, if you try to be on the same level of your shooting object or lower and shoot a bit upwards, it, it all helps also to clean the background. So this is also something to uh, look out for, to check, check your background. Um, I'll put all of these up. And, and of course, to get as close as possible if you, um, to get as much light in. Um, this is also depending, of course, on which lens you use. Um, and also what I found out is that you shouldn't always focus too much on one shot if you can't get it, um, because there will always be the next one. So, um, yeah, basically so much for framing. And of course, um, same with the light. I, my, my favorite suit, sh shooting um, depth is around 5 to 15 meters because I really like using still available light um, and just adding a bit of um, extra light with, um, with my lights to it. Um, next up, what I see a lot of people do is they film hours of footage. So keep the clips short because you will also, um, of course, as a, if, if you have a humpback whale coming up, you don't want to limit your clip to 15 seconds. But if it's just regular reef shots, try to get the best shot and then aim for yeah, 10, 15 uh, seconds because usually you will not need more of that and it will help you and save you time in uh, post-production. Um, the amount of clips, like when I look through my old stuff that I've shot many years ago, I, I recorded so much, so much more footage that, um, yeah, could have been avoided and then will, will also save you time that I will not use at all. It is something that time and practice will teach on what and how to shoot. Um, I think if you start out uh, doing video, it's always hard when to trigger the rec button and when to stop. Um, so it's a bit of a practice but um, or experience, but try to also think about it because it will help you. And just because it's all digital and you can delete it and everything, tr try to limit uh, your shots still. Um, it really helps me. Also, when I sometimes I do that, I still shoot um, some films of analog. Um, so you have your 36 pictures and you think a lot more about it and it really helps me. And since I shoot with the C200 and it has massive, massive file sizes because it shoots in raw video and I have uh, 1.2 gigabits per second of uh, data. So one, one trip has sometimes between three to four terabytes. Um, I really need to know when to film and what, when not to. And I think this helped me become better at, um, at filming. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, moving stills when to use. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I forget. Yeah, it's the same in, uh, in this picture. Um, like certain things I would film more. Like if you have um, uh, Oceanic uh, coming up to you, of course you want to get everything you want. But with the with some reef shots, I would. If you know you already have a better one and you don't need it, then just leave it. Uh, or stuff you always see a lionfish. If you have ten shots of a lionfish and you see another one, but he is in a not so good position to film, then just leave it. It's, uh, in my opinion, not really a point unless you, of course, use it for other purposes or you want to document it for scientific stuff uh, whatso whatsoever. Um, you yes, Simon. Uh, you just mentioned shooting in RAW. Um, uh, some people were asking, uh, A, is it a good idea to shoot in RAW? And B, is it, uh, are there any cameras that are sort of affordable that shoot RAW? Well, it is more and more getting popular into the semi-pro um, area, uh, and it's more affordable for sure. Um, it helps a lot. The more data you get underwater, the better. I would always recommend to shoot in the highest quality possible, but you need to be able to edit it as well. Um, so for someone that doesn't have the, the workflow, the hard drives, the RAID system, um, the editing tools, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you have that and you know what you do, of course, um, you always get the better quality out of it. Um, because it sounds all cool, all raw video, but once you do film a lot with it, it's, uh, yeah, it's heavy, heavy data. Um, so, yeah, it, it always depends. And affordable cameras, like there, there's Blackmagic, which is really affordable. affordable. Now you can record external on some Nikon uh, cameras. And, of course, now the new Canon EOS R5 that is coming up uh, can record 8K RAW internally, which will be crazy and which will also be a camera that I will for sure get for underwater video. Um, so I'm really excited about that, but um, uh, I don't want to go back from RAW. Like it's, uh, or at least 10 bit. Yeah. And, and sorry, um, one more question, um, because there were quite a few people asking about white balance. Are you coming to white balance later or is it useful to talk about it now when we just mentioned the red filters? Mm, well, I, I want to talk about white balance in the, um, in the editing part, but I didn't talk about or plan it uh, really. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay. No, so uh, several people are can, asking um, when, when, to, when to do your white balance, uh, if you have a GoPro, what to do with white balance. Um, and um, yeah, how can you set your white balance? What's the smart way to set your white balance if when you're underwater? So maybe yeah. Okay, I'm 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 really uh, in in maybe Simon, you can help me with the, the translation. I I say in German you say pusher. <laughs> cheater maybe. <laughs> the cheater. Uh, well, I am. Um, I don't use a chart. Um, I maybe should use one. I should use a white balance card. But what I really like to do is I either use sand if it's available. And if not, I like to use the back of a, a tank um, to do my white, white balance on. And it for me, it works really great. And all I got to do in uh, post-production is slight adjustments. But this might also be due to the camera because I have a lot of control with it. Uh, so I'm not 100% familiar with the GoPro's manual capabilities. All I did use with GoPro's was, was all shot in uh, automatic and I will um, slightly adjust the white balance afterwards. Um, in general, of course, with every depth, your white balance uh, changes. And I would recommend if you have the option in camera to manually do white balances, I'm not sure about GoPros, to be honest. Maybe no, you, you know can't. more about that, no. actually, Simon. You can't. No, you can't. Okay. Okay. Um, but with any camera that, like, you can do proper white balance, uh, just take uh, also your uh, your chart where you write on and use that, uh, or you can use a gray card underwater as well to balance your colors. And 
I, I don't do it that often. I it's not like that every depth I do a new white balance. Maybe because I'm lazy because I have the raw capabilities. Um, but I always try to get the colors as good in camera as possible. Um, so I'm not the best in white balance. Uh, white balancing your camera i'm a bit of a yeah for sure in in german you know like, what uh, me too I, I don't do I, things perfectly right i'm the huh? same you know so that's the funny thing so i don't know who, who joined my photography talk but i also uh don't use a slate i just use my hand mostly and you know if my hand looks skin color then the white balance is roughly okay um if you have sand that works or the gray area of sharks but i also would only change it maybe once per day or once per trip even and the rest of just do it of course i have more options in a in a raw photo but essentially the fine tuning you're going to have to do anyway in the post yeah but what, what what's really really well i i need to change uh, here so we have a nicer image um what's uh, what i what, what is a real big difference of course uh, when white balancing is if you shoot with likes or not because if you shoot with, when I shoot with the, the, the lights, I always set my white balance to the Kelvin of my, um, my lights. So this of course makes a big, big difference that we just didn't talk about right now. Um, if I shoot ambient without the lights, then I set my white balance. And what I do now, which is I, I, a bit maybe off the beginner's uh, chart here, but I use, um, I use filters on the lights and not on the camera to balance basically uh, onto the ambient light. So this is a uh, fairly new, I think Keldon introduced it maybe three years ago. Um, so what I do is I use a daylight light and I put a, a, a blue filter basically that will um, adjust to the to the ambient light. And then I have a red filter on the camera or you can have a red filter on the camera, I don't put it on and I don't always use that. This is perfect if you have super clear water um, and blue water like in Egypt, uh, Bahamas, then this is perfect. But in other um, waters, it's not always ideal. But here it's more important, like if I use these ambient uh, filters, then it's more important, of course, to white balance. And whenever I see my screen get a uh, shift in color, then I, I would look for my body or for sand to, to adjust the white balance. And whenever I don't use them, I have one fixed uh, white balance on daylight. All right, and so, what I wanted to say about movement in video is also you can capture um, different things. For example, here, this is, uh, I, 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 it was too much now to uh, go through all the hard drives to um, pick out the shots, but um, therefore this is in YouTube open now. This was also the trip with uh, Simon on, uh, in Komodo. And for example, if you take a picture or a video of a nudie, there is not much movement going on. You should try to be stable for macro and also there's in general not much movement going on but of course you have like a bit movement but for example the next like try to capture try to capture this with a still photo i hope everyone could see it um and it was smooth enough but there are certain things where you should or, or you can take advantage of video, which I think is really cool and use them. So whenever there is movement where you know, oh, okay, this would be cool to see. Or for example, if it's uh, just some soft corals, you know, um, doing, going in the current, um, this is stuff you, you can't really capture that great in stills. And this is the advantage where, where I would always try to, to capture these movements. So wherever there is a moving subject that um, will appear different, then use it. Um, and what's a bit boring is if you stay focused on one subject that doesn't move. So either the, the like here, the oceanic is moving around you and you follow it, or if you film a reef, for example, the other shot, then swim towards it and get movement in. 
This is also at the beginning of the video the, that Simon showed, uh, the Red Sea video, um, especially the, the reef shot. I went towards it and I speed ran it later to get movement and interest in because basically there's otherwise you have a few small fish that move, but that was it. So that's what I always like. And later in the editing part, I will show the um, when to pick which clip and when to use the movement. And of course, really important is uh, the story. So story is always key and helps. And um, there, uh, yeah, tr music uh, is the next slide, but make it also uh, short and not boring. So if you tell a story, don't, don't think about a script or a storybook. Start small and basic with uh, something simple to start. Um, and also about the length, which is uh, basically the same for the story and the editing. Don't make it too long. So I think um, a video that has a show to people and they want to rewatch it and say, oh, I would like to see it again, then this is a good length. No one wants to see um, a 10 minute video um, and, and after three minutes be like, okay, when is it done? When is it done? So make it interesting. And uh, if people want to rewatch it, I think this is the best sign that first of all, they like it and that had it the right length because, okay, it wasn't that long. I can watch it again. Um, what did I... Uh, Simple, basic, I said that, yeah. So um, basically think about the story before you shoot. So if you go on a trip, then um, plan it. What, what would be interesting to film also above the water to show certain things. For example, here we have in the uh, picture uh, where Sarah is in, we went uh, diving in a river on a canoe, which was quite something and went camping on the river um, so this tells the story as well and you need these shots online if you just film the underwater part it wouldn't tell the story same as the other shot with uh, Sasha she's um, uh, she's walking on ice and, and, uh, and you can't really see it but it was snowing at the time in cold conditions along a ship that is frozen in and uh, this really tells the conditions the outside the environment so always think about that what can you use above water or in general to tell uh, the story what about where you are and and so on okay um, next up uh, is the music really important because all your emotions come through music okay not all but I would say 70 to 80 percent of your emotions will come through music so picking the right music is really important and uh, take your time. Um, it takes me a lot of time to go through all the music to pick the right song, but it helps. If you have the right music, then the rest is easy, I would say. Um, and I see a lot of dive videos always use the same like mood, but I like I did with the um, Egypt video, I like to, to spice things up sometimes, use something dynamic which um, has its ups and downs to make it more interesting or also the video that uh, you saw at the beginning with the GoPro. Um, yeah, so spice it up. And for that I use, uh, for my, all my music, I, I use Artlist. For anyone that is really just starting out, you can look for royalty free music as well. Um, but for anyone that does it where he wants to upload it to YouTube or whatsoever, I just can recommend that there's so much music on there. And um, yeah, uh, I think one of the best platforms and you can use all the songs as long uh, as you like. Yes, I mean, you have there's a question? No, there's no free uh, software, uh, free um, uh, place to find audio that-, that There are, there, there are free places. Um, I just, I would need to look them up. Um, maybe we can, um, I can give it to you later, a link, and you can send it out in an email for people that uh, will look for music. Um, but mainly, like, it is, for starting out, I think the best solution uh, to get some free music. But um, if you want to get more quality in it and more options, then, um, yeah, this is a, 
this is the next step, I think. Yeah. So yeah. By the way, guys, I'm going to send out an email like after every uh, webinar and uh, Nico will give me whatever links uh, he would like to share. Also, what you see here in the presentation, if there are links, I will send them all out tomorrow uh, with an email to everybody. Yeah, and the next up is uh, watch other videos. Get uh, same with photography. Get inspired. Uh, try to analyze them, but uh, yeah, not copy it. I mean, you can copy it, but spice it up um, because it's training how where certain shots taken. Think about them. Um, learn and listen from from others. Um, I wish when I was 13, 14, someone would have told me all about the videography, like watching this webinar uh, 10 years ago would have been amazing. Like I had no idea and basically learned everything by myself. But now with all the YouTube uh, videos and webinars and stuff that Simon's doing, there's so much information. So use that um, to listen and of course practice. Like I really could see the improvements over the years every year my videos got better and better and better and um, it is also nice when when you know oh okay or when you look back oh my god I've been there but what I achieve now so this is all done through practice and failing and learning so yeah um, and then yeah same same with the GoPro video just do if you don't go on a big trip to Raja or um, somewhere special, just w w this uh, video I showed you at the beginning of the GoPro, um, Sarah and I were in Canada and it was our first dive together and I didn't want to take the big camera, but kind of wanted that memory. And, um, and I'm really happy I did it because it was not a lot of work. And so this is always a, a simple dive that, um, that you can uh, practice with and learn with. I learned a lot about filming with GoPro in that dive. So yeah, and going back to GoPro, I had a few um, things uh, point, things I wanted to point out. Of course, it's really cheap, uh, small, which is uh, good for the GoPro, um, easy to use. I mean, you turn it on, press the button, you have a screen on the back, so that's really cool. It has, I think, a really good video quality um, for the form and size factor and it's a good start unfortunately there are of course a few cons to it so it is small and clumsy so if you wear dry gloves or if you uh, yeah have have don't have your um, hands free to hold it it's a bit hard to press the buttons and everything but this can be worked around I couldn't find really any manual settings on on that and um, it's not so great for macros. But for beginning, if you just want to document a fun dive, like I showed you at the beginning, I think it's the perfect, perfect start for, for that. Um, and yeah, of course, it's not so great for stills photos. It's really just meant for videos. And uh, I would recommend getting accessories if you want to really film with the GoPro permanently. Um, I mean, it's easy to use. I know a few people that uh, work in the dive industry that have it because of that, because it's so simple, small. But what they do is they have they have their tray system, and uh, they have a tray system, and they have uh, lights that they added, and um, yeah. And this is stuff I would uh, talk about now. It's a bit of a gear talk, and after that, I depending on the time, Simon, you need to tell me if I need to hurry up or whatsoever. I would uh, show the editing uh, part. Yeah, no, we definitely are going to overrun a little bit, but uh, our regulars are used to this. So don't worry about it. Just uh, keep it. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, let's talk about gear. Um, the bigger, the better. Sure not. So not always the bigger camera um, helps. Um, I bet if I give this, uh, if, if I give my camera to a few people, the results will not be better. Um, maybe even worse because it, ha it doesn't have any automatic settings. So don't always focus on a big camera. I am personally, I'm a big fan of these uh, one inch compact uh, cameras, um, which I'll talk in a second. Next off, uh, you need uh, uh, a camera. Yeah, of course it's essential and housing helps. Um, 
filters, as I talked before, filters and lights. And um, yeah, uh, the, I wouldn't spend too much money on the camera and nothing on the lights. Like there needs to be a balance. If you don't have any gear yet and you want to spend something, then calculate with the, a good amount for accessories and lights as well, because that is really essential for underwater filming. Um, because lights really changed um, changed a lot for me. Um, so what's important for that is that you get lights with that have a smooth gradient. So if you have a normal dive torch and it's a spot a one, then it doesn't look as pleasing because it, you have that one spot and circle in your image and and what you want though is a really nice uh, spread of the or beam of the light to get a smooth um, yeah smooth overall uh, lit up image um, and then the position of them so get them as far out as possible so if you have arms um, that's perfect um, and I'll show you also why you need to get them out and why you need to get the right angle of your subjects um, because you can do really magic with uh, the right position of your lights. And of course, the closer you get to your subject, the more powerful, the more lights you or more colors you, you can get into your videos. And uh, I would use your body, like if you're waiting for something or there's nothing happening or you need practice, use your body as a reference to light them up and um, check your angle and the distance, um, also the color um, to yeah, get, get prepared for when, when the big sharks are coming. Um, also check your cameras on the behavior. So also make sure that the white balance is not totally off when you use lights um, on what it is set. So yeah, you, you just see that when you film your body. So now what's really important when you um, have your lights, not it's just basically the same rule as in photography as well. Don't point them directly at an inwards pointing angle at your subject because then as you see in the left picture all the back scatter and particles you will light up in front of the camera and you don't get such a clean shot but if you have them pointed toward out or if you the best thing to do is um, go one or two meters away from your sh shooting object and then point them so that the beam angle just matches um, the if you use two lights um, so you don't film all the backscatter. But if you only use one light, you also can do that. But instead of having it on the side, um, use it on top of the camera. Um, and also same applies there. Don't point it downwards. Check for the angle of the beam because the, the good thing about these cameras or uh, about these lights is they have a really wide beam angle. And therefore you can almost point it forward or even upwards and because of the high beam angle you just cut in front of your object so this takes a bit of practice but when you get lights this is really important so you get these really nice clean uh, particle free backscatter free uh, shots and I remember the first time I ever used a strobe underwater um, it was also 2010 11 I think I was like I remember the first picture where I had the strobe really set up. It was bad visibility. And uh, the first pictures I always took with an internal strobe, you always lit up the backscatter on particles. And then I took the picture and I was like, wow, this is uh, better than in real life. And yeah, it's uh, sometimes quite fun to see what you can do with lights. So for my recommended setup, um, I would start off with a one inch uh, compact camera. There are, for example, a very popular one is the Sony RX100, um, but also the Canon G7X Mark III. Maybe due that I uh, am trainer for Canon, I prefer this camera a bit more, um, but it's really, they both are great cameras. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I just recently did a few videos for Canon with this camera and uh, learned about it. So, um, if I could shoot, or if I, if I wouldn't do this professionally right now, I would probably, and I had the option to go for a dive somewhere and I could pick any camera, really any camera, 
I most likely would pick the G7X Mark III to take diving because it's compact, small, it records 4K, I can put it in a small housing. The housing is basically the same as, uh, as Sarah's. This is, uh, the housing is from Fantasy. And that's the next point, get a, I would I said future-proof housing. So when you get one of these housings, make sure that you get one that is capable of uh, adapting for, for um, lens, for example. Oops, for lenses, for example, so that you have an M67 millimeter thread. And um, so you can attach uh, macro lenses, uh, wide angle lenses and all of that. And uh, make sure that you have um, a thread. So this is a polycarbonate ca carbonate housing is probably the first that I would recommend, uh, which is really has a good value for the price. And of course, there are more expensive ones, which do offer a bit more that are aluminium um, from Isota or Nauticam and yeah so there are many options um, and then a tray and the lights um, so make sure that the housing is capable of um, using um, a tray and there I would recommend also that they have at least two screws so the first housings that I had they only had one um, screw for a tripod mount and using a tray it's not fun because of um, the oh, now my English uh, is at its end because of the hebel because of the tilt yeah hebelwirkung in Deutsch yeah, you loosen up the screw and, and it's really not fun. I had one whole dive holiday with it and it was terrible. And since then only used uh, two screws at least. Um, so make sure about that as well. Uh, for the lights, make sure, yeah, you can get one light and get another one later. Make sure that they have a decent amount. So first of all, that they have a wide uh, spread and then that they have enough power. I would re really recommend go for 4,000 to 5,000 lumen. My first videos, also the, the video I um, shot for Simon on, in Commodore only two or three years ago was shot with these, these lights here. These are 5,000 lumen lights and I used them with my big rig and they did a perfectly uh, fine job for me. So if you can get a light with a decent amount of lumen, make sure not to get too cheap ones from some Chinese areas because they tend to flicker. Of course, Kelden is probably the high-end uh, version and they can get up to 30,000 lumen, um, but this will come in at a size, weight, and of course, a price. And yeah, if, if you don't have lights, then use a red filter. Um, if you if you had the uh, choice of one, let's say eight thousand lumen light or two four thousand lumen lights, what would you suggest? So let's say I can afford either oh, one eight thousand or two one. four thousand. That's a difficult one. I I, I right now, probably um, two years ago or one year ago, I would have said I would go for two times uh, four thousand lumen. But what I sometimes really do is I put both my lights up um, to get even further away from the particles because you shoot 16 to 9. And, uh, and therefore, you know what I mean? If I go up, I have less particles that I film, basically. And, and therefore, I use my lights and put them upwards. So I shoot like I'm using one light only. And I feel like this is uh, quite something sometimes. The other thing is the handling. Having two lights, the rig is more balanced and it's a bit nicer. So it's a really tough question. I think if I can get a really good deal for 8,000 lumen light, I would go for it. If it's both the same price, I probably would stick with two, 4,000. Yeah. And if you shoot macro, it doesn't really matter anyway. Another so question. For macro, it... Yeah. Sorry, another yeah. question from uh, Johannes, which is very good, um, is don't, doesn't the light scare off wildlife sometimes? Yes and no. Sometimes it even attracts it. Um, 
Like uh, on the last trip with Simon in, in Egypt, uh, I, I was lucky to have the lights because the Oceanic really liked them and came close up uh, to me. Uh, that, that was good. But yes, sometimes, of course, uh, the light disturbs them. Um, but not as much as it does the, with the bubbles. I think your bubbles and the noise you make is, uh, is worse than the lights. Because during the day, you have a bright daylight. Night dive is different, but during the day, it's not as bad, I think. There are other factors that are worse than, um, than lights. Yeah, OK. All right. Um, any questions about gear? I, because I then I'm I was... some questions for the end, um, which are specific. Um, one thing I think that was uh, asked a lot earlier, which I think is interesting when you're talking about arm setup, is uh, buoyancy. Um, your yeah. rig is very big, but I think it's neutrally yeah. buoyant as it is, right? But what if you have a yeah, small so my... camera, then it's not... That's a good question. Um, yeah, so my, my rig weighs in total about 20 kilos, ready to go in the water. But once it's in the water, it's neutrally buoyant. And also I have... Tra I didn't unpack them, um, but I have a rail system on the bottom so with weights, so I can even adjust that and I can add weights on, on the bottom to make it really perfectly buoyant. But if I had a smaller camera, I would try to make it maybe a tiny bit negative. Um, and if you have a wet, so it always depends on how you rig your camera, because a big factor is, for example, the wet lenses. So right now, if I use if I use this uh, wet lens here, it's he super heavy. It's, I think, around six kilos. So, and this is already the buoyancy built in, but it's not enough to um, balance it out. So therefore, I need bigger float arms. So when I change from macro to wide angle, I need to change my arm system as well, which is a bit annoying. Um, and the smaller the camera gets, the less weight difference you have. But I would, uh, yeah, I would make sure that you have a fairly balanced uh, rig system that helps. Um, so float, float arms, um, I don't have them out here. They're in here. Um, but yeah, this is the small version basically. And um, there are carbon ones that have air inside basically. Or what you also can do is take uh, some of these arms and put, um, uh, float arms on top, uh, not float arms, put floaters on top, like uh, from some float material, I don't know the name for it, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky, it's not easy, and that is something you have to do for every uh, rig yourself to, to find it. And I remember the first time I got the camera, I wasn't sure how much I will need, so I went and, uh, in, into a local pool and did some tests. Of course, this was a uh, fresh water, so it was behaving a bit different. But in general, I, I got the right amount of um, float arms um, set for it. And I always, when I know I do macro and wide angle, I always take another set of arms with me because I know if I do macro, then I need less float and otherwise my camera will just go up. Yep. I don't know right. where so, we can talk about mm -hmm. this. Um, if you prefer, we can talk about it at the end, but there are quite a lot of questions around if you should always shoot in 4K or, uh, you know, or if you should shoot lower resolution, especially if you've got a camera that will start cropping if you go to a uh, lower resolution. So, uh, okay. Canon so RP I, I think you. Crops. RP, yeah, okay. So, um, and then I would go into the editing and I can talk about the resolutions here as well. Um, okay. So as well for the links, uh, I will give Simon all the informations for the, or, yeah, you, you can write them in for the programs. Um, but first of all, you need to find the right software that's the right for you. If I would rank, rec recommend you DaVinci Resolve, for example, that I use um, mainly for color grading underwater, you, some of you might probably not be happy with it because it has too many buttons, can do too much. So if you're really starting out, um, an easy start is, for example, iMovie um, or 
even on the tablet you can edit, um, which I'll show you in a minute. And uh, or another thing is a Shotcut. It's an open source a free software which works for PC and Mac, which is a bit in between iMovie and uh, Final Cut and Pre Premiere Pro, DaVinci. Um, so this is something you need to find for yourself. I can recommend a few and you need to see which operating system you have and, and so on. Um, yes, Simon. One, um, one software that many people are using is Dive Plus. Would you, you know that one? It's a... Uh... You don't know that one? It's like the easiest one. You no. don't do anything. You just drop your videos in and it does all the white balancing for you. And oh. Yeah. Okay. Maybe no. I'll send you a link. To be honest. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And it was the first time today that I uh, opened iMovie for a long time. Um, but I want to show you a few things that you can do in there. Um, but uh, I was really surprised at what what changed, and um, so yeah, don't I I want to recommend the right software, but I really I'm so deep into Final Cut, Resolve, and Premiere Pro that it's hard to know every software, especially the ones that are not that don't make so much sense for me to use. So um, I had a quick look into it, but best of your yeah. You listen also to Simon and, and find some uh, other softwares as well that, that do the job for you. So I personally, anyway, sorry, if, I can just, if I can just help out here, I, I wanted to see what you say, but I, I really don't like Dive Plus because it's, um, it's uh, the colors are very reddish um, and they're quite extreme and they're not static. So they kind of change. So in the same situation, I mean, you, I don't think you would like it, but I, I did, uh, you, you you have a look at it. It's super easy. It's the easiest of them all, but I just okay. find the, the colors are not really nice. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, uh, for me, so, for example, iMovie was not easy after coming from all these uh, programs where you can do basically everything, and then going to iMovie, I'm like, oh, where, where do I do this? But it's really when you know it, okay, yeah, it makes sense. It's simple. So um, for someone starting off, it's, uh, it's always a different perspective, I think. And uh, re the most important thing is uh, you, that you're able to do uh, certain color correct or that you have certain color correction tools because that's the most important part in post-production for video editing. That you can twerk or tw not twerk, <laughs> uh, tweak on the colors. <laughs> um, yeah, make it simple. Don't don't over edit stuff. Don't think you need to do crazy um, effects or whatsoever. Also with the, the transitions. I remember the first videos I did, uh, the first ever videos I did were like um, skiing videos, you know, doing jumps and backflips and all of this. And, and I found these effects on how to transition. And watching them now, it feels like you're in a really, really bad Star Wars movie with all these funky transitions so sometimes it's easier to stick with it simple do a fade or um just a hard cut um because yeah i don't see any high-end videos nowadays having these cool effects um, that are built in in all these softwares um yeah get a structure in your edit so um, what I like to do is I, I take a song and I take it apart. I know, okay, this is the build-up, this is the start, and there I will show, for example, landscape, the boat, the people, so to introduce stuff. And then the beat drops, and then you have some of your highlight shots, uh, the shark, the manta, whatsoever. And uh, then try to keep the tension and then find an ending. Sometimes there, there is some lower parts in some music where you can, for example, go back on the boat, show the um the food uh like certain things so i categorize or i i chapter the videos um of course i don't title them in chapters but for myself i put chapter marks to to get a structure in there and also that you don't shoot like underwater above water underwater or you go from shark uh nudie shark manta nudie so to keep all the macro stuff together to keep all the night dives together. So to, to get a simple, nice structure in there. So it's easy and nice uh, for, the, for the people to watch. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. So in 2020, we are so used to Instagram stories really quick. Like the amount of time we spend on looking at an Instagram story and clicking the next one is so crazy how quick we analyze images and realize what's going on. So don't make it too boring and do a 38 minute long video. You can, but then do a short one if you want to show it to people. Because I had the experience on a boat. I had to watch at the end of the trip. I think it was at least half an hour long video. And it was basically all the same shots. And they were so long. And everyone just wanted to have their beers and, you know. But, yeah. So, keep it short. And, uh, yeah, f find the balance between the shots. So, not if you do a trip in Komodo. Of course, there are lots of mantas, but don't do... Um, don't do one shot of a manta and the rest full of reefs. Don't do uh, a, a video full of mantas and only show a few shots of some other stuff. So find the right balance to make it interesting and not boring. Um, and always take the best shots. So if you have the same shot um, of a manta coming uh, around uh, five, six times, use the best one. And uh, sometimes it hurts to pick, but throw the other ones away and stick stick with it yeah so uh, that's so far some tips for editing and now i would like to go into resolve and i prepared here a little um edit uh basically and i want to show a few it's things i uh, is i did i say resolve yeah oh i'm sorry this is iMovie. Um, I I wasn't surprised uh, how uh, how much you already can do and how quick it works as well. And uh, to starting off doing your first videos, I think it's really great if you're on um, on Mac, if you're on Windows. And then I think there a shortcut is a good uh, option, and there are other things. But I took an old video. This is from the TZ5. So it's a camera that is um, five, no, not five, uh, 12 years old. Um, and I'll just play that. So it's quite, it's quite shaky. Uh, something was really off with the white balance here. And, and first thing I did, I stabilized it. So basically he, up here you have your effects and there you can stabilize it. And, and I was amazed that a free software can already, like I, I know it back then when it was first introduced by Adobe, um, Warp Stabilizer, and now it's basically in every app and every software. Next up, you already see a big difference in color. All I did here is click the auto uh, color button. So yeah, and then I did another another one where I just did a little bit more on the contrast. And this is a really, yeah, I would say shit video from back then, but um, yeah, you, you see the difference. You can quite do a certain job even in, in a very limited program, which is super simple. Um, so yeah, next, uh, Simon, I, I, have, I wanted to show here a small edit. Do you think I should uh, show how to do it in iMovie or just talk about what I did time-wise? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe just point out how, what your thought process is because every software is a bit different. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, so um, now let's get rid of this. So basically here I prepared a little part. So I have some clips here um, and when you select a clip with iMovie or other programs, usually they give you a preview. And in the preview, you can already set your in and out points. And this is uh, the part where I start to pick what I want in the video. Um, so for example, in, uh, for this turtle shot here, which was this one, um, I scrubbed through the video clip and then I was looking for the biggest change. So at the end of the clip, not much changes. But right here, there we have a little movement. Uh, there is a change of light. So this is for me the most interesting part. There's the, the most going on. And the rest there is, it's really like pretty much a still image. So that's why I picked this part, for example, here. And then next up, 
we have uh, again i talked about not shooting downwards but here i ooh, uh, do you hear the I need to turn down the volume here we're not hearing the audio um okay uh here the the turtle is like having this drop and and it just goes with the music. I'll play the music in a second. And it fits right to the next shot. So for me, you have the turtle, it's facing downward, like it's about to dive. And then you add it into uh, the turtle diving down. I speeded it up a bit because it was quite slow. And then I have a reaction shot basically. Um, and also here, I, I use the music to build up. So, um, let me go into Zoom to share my audio as well. Uh, Simon, can I share the audio? Do you have a ah, share computer sound? Okay. So I, I will turn the volume a bit down. Tell me if it's too loud or yeah. So we can't hear it now. I don't know if it's playing it. You can't hear it? No. You couldn't hear it? There's also Simon? No, we, we also don't see it playing. You, uh, okay. I said share if you, audio. If you, if you, no, but we didn't even see the video playing. So maybe you just press play on the, um, on the preview. Does that work? We're not seeing that. You're not seeing that. That's not good. Oh, I see. I, I, oh, there we go. Now it should work. So we have the turtle. Yeah, we don't hear the sound. Okay. Don't worry then, about it. Don't uh, worry we just got to imagine. There, there, there's a build up, a build up coming where I have slow shots. So here you start off with a reef shot, and and then you start with the turtle. You show the turtle, but I wouldn't for for a small edit. This would be enough turtle shots for me. These would be the best ones. And I say, okay, I'm done with uh, turtles, and and because they are slow, they there I take the slow part of the music, which was here, and there was a build up and. Then there was a drop where it started to be quicker. And then a quicker edit would start where you have some, I, I speeded up a shark to um, yeah, just pump in. And, and then there would be a quicker, quicker rhythm uh, starting. And, and really to do this, it is, this took me like one minute, two, two minutes to just do these five clips after another. So if you already know what you shot, and if you stick to not shooting too much uh, unnecessary footage, you can be really, really quick in edits. Of course, you need the practice to know your program, but once you know it and you want, once you get the practice to know where to put the clips together, you can get really fast. So um, for some people that edit all their pictures, like you do, I don't know how many hours you spend in Lightroom editing many. pictures. Um, many hours, yeah. So I think the time you spend in Lightroom um, is about the same time I would do for an edit, depending on how crazy the edit gets. So if it's really simple, I, I sometimes do videos in, in uh, yeah, half an hour, like the, the GoPro video, it's quite simple to do. Uh, so okay. if I may make a summary um, there, just I, I, what I really take away, and that's one thing that also myself, when I, two videos is really important to remind myself is make the clips short and connect several clips to one scene. Cause you were talking about the turtle turning and then actually another turtle swimming and then that turtle sitting. They're not actually the same turtle, but you're making one turtle sequence out of three clips rather than making one long one. And that's something yeah. that I always find when my own videos, they always seem too long. And you look at one of your videos or, you know, other more experienced guys are actually, you know, very short bits um, 
essentially only what's interesting for the story and everything else goes out the window. So that's, I think, an important learning. And also you said, we couldn't hear it, but the audio that you're tuning the video to the audio, I think that's also very important um, that many people don't do, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a big, big part. Audio is so, so important. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> it makes a big, big difference. Big right. difference. So, um, because you're on the boat, you don't want to necessarily bring your computer with you or you, I don't know, you don't even have one, you just have your tablet or even your phone. It is a bit tricky because the screen is really small, but you can edit easily on on an iPad nowadays. Um, so I will show you that. Therefore, I'll stop sharing the screen and I can show you my uh, iPad screen. So there's an app here called Luma Fusion, and also I prepared a small part here and. I think it is really crazy how much you can do in this uh, in this app. Um, so basically, what I did here is I took the same clips, send them to to the um, iPad. With this is an iPad Pro, so with the later versions of iPad, all you gotta do is plug in an adapter for your SD card or your hard drive, and you can straight away edit from your external hard drive. So all of this on on um, on the device editing is not even necessary uh, necessary um, and you can do so many things you can uh, use the videos from Dropbox and all of these different uh, things so let's have a look at uh, Luma Fusion so I had I created a new album in photos directly where I can have a look at uh, right now and here, for example, if I would, um, I already picked a clip here. Um, I can basically scrub through the time timeline with my thumb. So I'll show you here, hope you can see it. So all I got to do to scrub through the timeline is go forth and back. And uh, then you can pick a clip that you, you'd like. Let's take the turtle head here, for example. And then here as well, you can set your in and out points. So you can scrub through, and this is probably the most interesting part. So when the when the turtle hits hits uh, down, like when it goes forward here, that, there's the most movement. So for, out of this, I don't know, 10 second clip, and um, these four seconds um, are for me the most interesting ones. Um, and then all you gotta do is uh, basically, if you have the clip selected. Drop it down in your timeline. Oh, basically, I didn't explain the base how an editing software works, but basically all of them have a so-called timeline. This is where all your footage sits. And as it says in the word timeline, it's where all your clips are and they add up to each other uh, in a row. And, and then you have a cursor. In this case, it's the, the blue part here. And it you can imagine it as an eye looking down on your clips and whichever clip comes up, this clip will show in your video and you can put them on top of each other and always the one on top will show us. So now the edit will be earlier. You can change the opacity and do all of these things. And this is already a lot more advanced than um, uh, iMovie, for example. Um, here you can go in and uh, do full on uh, color grades. You can edit several tracks. You have um, audio editing capabilities. Um, and all of these things and um i could re i won't do that now i could recreate here the same edit to show you the music because the music plays off here um but basically what you can do for example is you can go in um then it doesn't work oh double click so there you of course have presets this unfortunately this footage is already the the graded one, um, because this is shot in RAW, I needed something to work with. Um, but here you can go in and use several effects. You have um, whoo, oh, all sorts, like too, too many that I even went through all of them uh, that you can apply. Where, where are the basic ones? Color effects. Um, 
Um, you can even apply Nico? film LUTs. Nico, Nico. Yes. Maybe because we're already at one and a half hours, maybe we... Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So we'll send a link to all these different softwares so uh, you can try this. How expensive is LumaFusion? So LumaFusion is paid, but it is about 30 euros. So it's really for what it can do. It's a full-on editing uh, tool for uh, Android and uh, iOS or for tablet versions. And it's it's crazy. Like, yeah. So I can just recommend it if you're on the dive boat and you could already straight um, start editing on the go or in the plane on the way back. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you want to... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so um, so far, any any questions, Simon? Um, yeah, we have a, a few more questions, but then, was this the last part? Because then I would say we just do a couple. The, the editing of part was, was the last part, yeah. So basically, okay. this is all I wanted to show, and I hope I could uh, show as much as possible. Yeah, but, it's always, uh, yeah. it always takes, uh, t time always flies, uh, because we, we have so much to share, but uh, uh, everybody's, or most people still here, so um, you, did a, you did that very good. I wanted to ask a few more questions that came throughout, um, uh, throughout the, um, you know, the chat and, and the Q&A that didn't fit uh, into different parts. But one part that I already mentioned earlier was the, uh, the question about 4K or other, um, you know, resolutions, what do you recommend? Uh, and also for somebody specifically asking about the Canon RP where it crops if he reduces it um, to, to 1080 mm. or 50 frames. Okay, so um, generally I would try to shoot at the highest res resolution possible unless it does something with the image, like which is a disadvantage for, in some reasons. For example, with the crop. I know, I, I mean, I have an RP and an EOS R here as well, and I did film with them. And f with these cameras, if I have them underwater, I would, or even above water, I'd draw the stick with the 1080p because there's a big difference as well. I remember my first uh, EOS 600D did film in um, in 1080p, and the EOS R uh, right here, or I have a, a C100 Mark II, that, which was my first cinema camera, was also in 1080p, but just the number, there's such a big difference. On paper, it's all the same, but really there's a big, big quality difference so it always depends of, on on the camera as well and i know for myself the eos r i'm really really happy with the image um it has a really good um, 1080p image output compared to the cameras before that i used uh, like a 5d mark ii or 5d mark iii um so there it depends for the rp i wouldn't go with the 4k i would rather stick with the full frame sensor uh, and use that unless you use for example um, what you could do depending on the housing I'm not even sure which housing it is for the RP but you could use the crop 4k and use uh, APS-C sized uh, lenses for it and then you can shoot a uh, super wide angle with the wide angle conversion lens as well so this would work it's possible but I'd recommend for rather stick with the um uh, uh with the full width of the sensor and as well the um some cameras they have different options of codecs so especially in the eos r 5d uh, i'm not sure about the other brands but you have all i and ipb and always go for the one with the higher uh, quality so all I would be the one for Canon users and the other ones I don't know usually it, it indicates the indication is the length of the video you c can record um, it's if you can afford it with the storage but um, this That's would a, be so technical good, uh, I could go into that now yeah. but you, you bring up a good point that I also just heard is like how do you store data um, came up earlier that connects very well to that question I, How do you recommend? I actually didn't want to. I, I didn't want to do this, but now it fits perfectly because right now there is. It, just just to give you an idea, I didn't want to move the camera away because you can see a little bit of the mess. But as you can see here, all of these are hard drives, 
And uh, these are not all of them. So um, I have a ton of hard drives. Um, I'm not sure how many terabytes, maybe 200 terabytes now. Um, and I have a RAID system. I use uh, also some online storage, but basically what I do is always, I t take two drives with me. Um, usually these uh, 2.5, like these 2.5 inch uh, um, solid state drives. This, is, this one, for example, has five terabytes now. And then I do um, a backup of both because I have so much footage. If you don't shoot raw footage, then you can use, of course, smaller ones. For example, here we have, uh, I have from SanDisk an SSD drive. Uh, they are super fast, like the transfer speeds are crazy. Um, and, and there you can store also two terabytes, so more than enough for most people. I like to have the backups, not necessarily for everyone, but if you have like SD cards and that, I think you, you should be fine. And then I um, store the hard drives away with the footage that I will keep as a backup and then I will use them on the RAID for editing. But yeah, every, everyone has a different workflow and for the upcoming project, I will be shooting a lot. So I will be at least needing more than 10 terabytes for one project. So, and I, I like to have my data together. So for this, I will probably shoot the whole or edit the whole thing on one RAID that is just dedicated for this one project. But this is a immense data so that probably not many will hopefully <laughs> Uh, have to deal with. Um, another question that we had from um, from Mark was, do you actually need a license to shoot the C200 that you're using? Or... A license? Yeah. You don't need a license, What do you right? mean by license? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, you, <laughs> like like, like for, for driving a car, a driver <laughs> license or... <laughs> and no, no. You just... You can... You can you can buy it uh, on, yeah. Um, okay, uh, some more question was about autofocus. Um, generally, do you recommend autofocus or, or not? Very good, I didn't talk about that. Oh, shame, Nico. Um, yes, that's really important as, actually, um, especially if you shoot with the largest sensor sizes. Um, or, and this is a reason why I uh, shot with the C200 is because of the autofocus. So there are many different cameras, also cinema cameras that um, can film. And I know from um, uh, someone who's selling these that the especially C200 is very popular because of the um, autofocus, um, which uses the dual pixel AF. So in video, it's different than in stills. Uh, so you, the sensor is, is basically also the AF system. And, and uh, okay, th this is now a bit technical, but uh, because I, I do uh, this for Canon as well, is they, each pixel has uh, two photo IOTs and uh, these ones do a face detection. So basically they do the same type of focusing that a DSLR does when uh, using the mirror. Um, but in, they have a lot more pixels um, or a lot more fields and they work together. Um, and the advantage of this is that it doesn't um, pump. So it is a very smooth focus. So from the point A to B, it is very smooth and it doesn't go above that. So some people, they might know this from their own experience or footage. If, you, if they have especially large sensors that the camera is doing like this forth and back pumping, and um, this is something that the C200 doesn't do. And this is why I love it to use it in autofocus because you don't need to focus on the subject, um, uh, on the focusing and can focus on other things. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's, for me, it's a total game changer, the autofocus, but not every camera has that feature uh, to have a really good, reliable autofocus. Um, the EOS RP has it, the EOS R, the R5 coming up. So all of these Canons, for the other manufacturers, they also have like the Nikon Z series. They have a lot more improved over, yeah, so, since uh, since they came out via software updates. But I'm not as familiar with these ones. Okay. But, but, yeah. Okay. Last question. Oh, because it came yeah. No. 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 Um, uh, last question. Uh, if you know the answer, because several people asked it, what's the best? Uh, coming back to the basics, GoPro eight setting. 
um, because or GoPro setting, do you recommend ProTune or not? Or you're not even going to make it? Uh, yes, I recommend ProTune if you know how to use it uh, afterwards, the editing. Um, if you never edited with ProTune, before, do, do a test. Do a test and you will see. But I would always shoot in ProTune if I can um to because it gives me more flexibility so uh, this was is something i didn't mention is picking like it's, it's about camera settings basically we could talk hours now about setting the camera up you have your um, picture profiles log profiles that you can choose and therefore i recommend if you know what you do then you can go with the the more flat profile this that has a more lat more latitude um which is something like protune but for anyone that is just starting out, go with a neutral uh, picture profile. So if you bump into your camera in the setting where it says portrait, landscape, automatic, neutral, I would go for underwater for neutral. And you can always add more contrast or uh, more saturation in post-production. But uh, it's, yeah, go, go for neutral. Go for it. Okay. Um, um, last question, uh, maybe more personal. Uh, how do you sell your videos? How do, these days can you make money as a videographer? How is it uh, possible to to get to production companies to pick you? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, it's. Um, is it, I don't think it's easy, um, especially underwater, because uh, there there's so many people that do really really good videos, um, and they just do it as their as their hobby. Um, so really the best paid jobs I get in is mainly for, um, commercial work underwater. Um, yeah, you do make money with it, but it's not a full living at the moment. It's a big part or, um, but I, I, I do have many things. So I have online filming. Uh, I have, uh, I, I do workshops for Canon, uh, all sorts of that. So I have different things that I do. Um, it's possible, but you need the dedication. And um, yeah, I also sell some stock stuff, like all of these clips you saw uh, today um, that I use for the editing, they are all on stock and they gave me a couple of uh, hundred bucks in. Um, so yeah, they're just living from it is I think really, really hard, but um, it's possible. Well, as I always say, also for us photographers, um, and Tobias was talking about it last week as well, it's, uh, you have to cook on many campfires to make a meal. And that's true, I think, for, yeah. for all of our art. I would like to uh, thank you very much uh, for this really great talk. Um, we, uh, we really enjoyed it, learned a lot, I hope. Um, some questions weren't answered, guys. I'm really sorry, um, just in view of time. Um, I am going to uh, send some email tomorrow with all the links. Um, just before uh, thanking Nico for his attendance, I just want to uh, point out that we have a couple more uh, talks coming up in the coming weeks and days. Uh, we've got conservation talks about corals and sharks. So we've got the World Wildlife uh, representative for Sharks and Rays talking to us, for example. Uh, we also have got more technical talks this week on Wednesday. You should definitely not miss uh, sorry, on Thursday, you should definitely not miss uh, Phil, our tech insider, talking about uh, how to extend your bottom times underwater in tech diving. So how to get into tech diving, what's the benefit? Uh, also, I started an underwater photography series. We just did part one. Part two is in two weeks. Next week, I'm doing Photoshop. And uh, this weekend, we also have uh, James Begeman, who is going to show us lots of uh, humpback whale behavior. So you can see all kinds of different uh, topics that are coming up. Uh, please uh, support our webinars uh, if you uh, think that we're doing a good job uh, because we're now getting quite uh, big costs with uh, increasing numbers. So if you want to support us, you can do that on this uh, funding page um, or you can just um, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel um, so we get more visibility. Um, and you, if you like, you can also join our Insider Divers community where we exchange lots of things. I would like uh, uh, to thank Nico for your time. Thank you, Nico. It was really great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and of course, uh, everyone is also more than welcome uh, to to follow uh, me on Instagram. And uh, Sarah and I, we have a right. cool project coming up. Do you want to? Um, you just want to switch to your share so you can show your link. 
Uh, yes, sure. That's so too. Um, so if you're interested in, you can uh, check it on, uh, on my Instagram, but on Sarah's, uh, she's a lot more active uh, on social media and Instagram because uh, we uh, did get a van and had a big plan for this year. Unfortunately, due to the current situation, things didn't go as as well uh, with our current plan, but we built basically built out the van into a dive dive mobile uh, travel um, uh, van to be, um, yeah, it's basically for an underwater road trip around Europe. And um, we're still now in the building phase, but almost done. So uh, if you wanna check that out and in the future, we'll hopefully, as soon as the whole situation gets a bit more calm and the borders open up again, uh, we'll have some cool con content coming up. So yeah, you're more than welcome to check that out as well. Cool, and I'll also send this link in the email. So uh, once again, uh, thank you everybody for your attendance and staying out this late. Um, yeah, and wish you all a good time. Stay safe and see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye, Nico. Bye.